Every year, panto season rolls around again, and amid the usual mixture of fairy tales and family favourites, we often find several versions of Dick Whittington and his cat around the country. Unlike Sleeping Beauty or Snow White, Dick Whittington professes to be based on a real person, and indeed Richard Whittington was a real historical figure. Born in around 1354, this wealthy merchant did become Lord Mayor of London, and he died in 1423. But cats are mysteriously absent from his biography, and the rags to riches story from the pantomime is somewhat different in reality. So what is his legend, and why did it become such a popular retelling of a real person's history? Let's find out in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there, and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult, and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author, and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I do hope that you're well on whatever day this is that you're listening to this. I'm not bad, thanks. So we're going to continue with the theme of historical people who've had legends attached to them. Now, obviously, we started with Boudicca last week. It was quite an interesting one because we really have no actual primary evidence from her time. But yet we still got these legends about her. Whereas this week, we're going to have a look at Dick Whittington. And there are records attached to him, so we can at least know a fair bit about the real person. But then we have to start asking ourselves where the legend came from. So if you're not familiar with the story of Dick Whittington, I am just going to jump straight into that now. So despite the somewhat well-bred origins of Richard Whittington, the legend of Dick Whittington has him born into poverty. And in most variations of the tale, Dick was an orphan. The earliest surviving ballad claims he lived in Lancashire, but later versions don't name his location, it's just somewhere outside of London. And wherever it is that he starts off, he decides to go to London. And there are different reasons for this, but the myth that the streets are paved with gold is an 18th century addition. Now when Dick arrives, he realises that the streets are paved with far worse than gold, and ends up cold, alone and hungry. And like many who move to London seeking opportunity to discover, it's sometimes not all it's cracked up to be. So Dick curls up at the gate of a wealthy merchant named Fitzwarren and somehow he's discovered and rather than being sent packing, Fitzwarren takes him in and hires him to be the new kitchen scullion. Now Dick ends up with a cat which later versions say that he bought himself, earning extra money by shining shoes and the cat solves the problem of a rat infestation in his garret room and if you've never been familiar with the idea of a garret room, it's usually just a really small room up in the attic so it's at the highest point of the house. Now later, Fitzwarren, being a businessman, mounts a trade expedition and Dick's cat ends up on board and the different variations disagree as to why and how that happens. But either way, the cat ends up leaving Dick's side. And Dick tires of his life as a scullion and tries to flee. Again, the variations differ as to why and in some versions he's just tired of the life that he's ended up in and other places it's because he's being bullied by one of the other kitchen staff. But all of the variations agree that he stops at a given part of London when he hears bells tolling. They apparently say, turn again Whittington, Lord Mayor of London, though the exact wording changes in every version. Meanwhile, Fitzwarren's ship is blown off course and ends up somewhere off the coast of North Africa. A local king buys the whole cargo and a rat infestation is threatening to derail their banquet, but eventually someone goes, aha, we have we have something that will deal with this problem, and the cat ends up killing all of the rodents, so the delighted king pays ten times as much for the cat as the rest of the cargo. The ship returns to London, and Fitzwarren gives Dick his share of the profits, which make Dick richer even than Fitzwarren, and Dick then goes on to join Fitzwarren in business, marry his daughter, and become Lord Mayor of London three times. Huzzah! So that's the legend. Obviously the pantomime does twist it slightly and you end up with all these weird things about king or queen rat and stuff like that. But that's the that's the legend that people would have known before the pantomime basically came along. Now, the story exists in written form as far back as the early 1600s, although this is still 150 years after Richard Whittington's death in 1423. And the earliest piece that survives intact is a ballad from 1612. In 1656, we find the earliest prose version by Thomas Haywood called The Famous and Remarkable History of Sir Richard Whittington. And this is the version that specifies which bells he hears, as in the bells at St Mary Le Beau, known as Bow Bells, 
although this version has Dick hear them at Bun Hill. Now, in terms of possible distances, this version makes far more sense. So if you're not necessarily that familiar with the topography and geography of London, the city of London is this weird little area inside of London, which is sort of the old medieval city, essentially, and it's kind of its own entity. Now, I think Bun Hill here refers to Bun Hill Fields, and that is just off City Road. It's now a graveyard, which is very, very nice if you want somewhere to have your lunch on a, on a nice summer's day, shall we say. I used to work around the corner from there. But anyway, Bun Hill Fields is in the city of London, so it would make sense that that would be as far as he would have gotten if he'd been going somewhere from the city of London. Other people think that he got as far as Highgate Hill, although that idea actually only dates to the 18th century, where you can still find the Whittington Stone at the foot of the hill, which apparently marks where he stopped. I should point out Highgate, by comparison, is approximately four miles away. It's around about just, just over seven kilometres away, I think, from the city of London. So for somebody who's on foot, Bun Hill makes more sense. Also in terms of still being able to hear bow bells as well. So there are other versions after that and even Samuel Pepys recorded going to see the puppet show version of the story in September 1668. And the story basically went on to become a favourite children's play and the first pantomime version dates to 1814. And it is perhaps the pantomime version which most of us are probably most familiar with today. And I saw it many, many years ago at Newcastle's Theatre Royal. And when I saw it, it starred Sue Pollard and the Chuckle Brothers. So I'm sure the British listeners among you will know who they are. So basically, you're probably asking, who was Dick Whittington then, if it was based on a real person? Well, like I said, Dick Whittington was Richard Whittington, son of Sir William Whittington of Pauntley near Newent in Gloucestershire. And he's believed to have been born in 1354 or thereabouts. Now, far from being born into poverty, as the legend would have you believe, he actually had family ties with politics because his father was an MP, his mother was the daughter of an MP, and two of his brothers were MPs. So suddenly, Whittington's role as Lord Mayor makes a bit more sense. Now, there is some element of truth in the legend because Whittington did go to London to make his way in the world because not being the eldest son in the family meant he wouldn't inherit the estate and therefore needed to create his own fortune. He was already a citizen of London by 1379 and in the city of London he became a mercer or fabric trader. Now I should point out he did choose his profession incredibly wisely because specialising in luxury fabrics put him in the company of the higher reaches of society which included royalty. Eventually Whittington branched out into money lending and even lent money to King Richard II. Now, Whittington did seem to have some kind of degree of being able to manage relationships quite well because he'd already formed a relationship with the king-to-be, Henry IV. So when Richard II was deposed, Whittington just picked up where he had left off with Henry IV. And as a result of this political manoeuvring, he managed to become sheriff of the city of London by 1393. Now, he first held the office of Lord Mayor of London in 1397, although I should point out that he was appointed the first time as the original incumbent of the title couldn't finish their role of office, but then he was elected a further three times. So he did hold the post four times, but was elected three times. But by 1402, he'd also become a wool trader and he also collected customs on wool in the city. And this is a time when English wool in particular was really, really valuable and really quite highly prized around the country. So it was quite good being able to collect customs on such a highly popular product. And then Whittington himself became an MP in 1416. Now, true to the legend, he did marry Alice Fitzwarren. So the name is indeed correct, according to the legend. And she was the wealthy daughter of Sir Ovo Fitzwarren of Dorset and Devon. Now, they didn't have any children, so Whittington invested his wealth into London itself. He funded a new drainage system in Billingsgate, he paid for public toilets to be installed, and he also paid for the construction of a ward for unmarried mothers at St Thomas's Hospital. Improving living conditions basically became a key concern for Whittington, and he even made provision in his will for them to create almshouses and a college for secular priests attached to the Church of St Michael Paternoster, where he was ultimately buried. He died in 1423 and was buried beside Alice, but unfortunately his tomb has now been lost. But it is quite interesting that he then has all these fabulous charitable works at the end of his life, and his charity still exists to this day. Now, in folklore terms, there are two quite important elements to this story. So the first is how on earth the rags to riches tale became the version that we know, but we're actually going to deal with that a little bit later on because I want to have a look at the second element, which is in my view the most interesting, and that's the cat because no one really knows where the link with the cat came from. And K.M. Briggs asked if he was just fond of them, or if he had one as an emblem, sort of 
why on earth would this cat get associated with this wealthy trader? Now, there are other mundane possibilities for the cat, and that's that it comes from cat, spelled C-A-T-T-E-S, which is a fleet of boats used for import or export, which clearly would link with his business ties. Or it could link to the scat being a bundle of possessions carried on a stick. I think that's possibly more wishful thinking. And alternatively, the other version is cat might be a mistranslation of the French word a chat or trade. So this would obviously reflect the fact that the real Whittington owed his wealth to trade rather than a cat. And over time, it's been evolved or misheard or whatever it might have been and then turned into this cat being the reason for his particular success. Now, some people have also suggested that the legends arose based on a particular engraving of Whittington. And if you want to see that, you can see it on the blog post, which is linked in the show notes below. And and basically, it's just Whittington sitting and he's got his hand resting on the back of a cat. People went, oh, oh, there's a cat in the engraving. Maybe that's where the legend came from. But sadly, it did not. Because the version on my blog is actually from the 19th century, but it is based on an engraving from 1590. And as it is... The story was actually already well known by that point and Whittington's hand originally rested on a skull in the image but a print seller then changed it to a cat to fit the existing story to boost sales. So no, it didn't come from that particular engraving. But there could be a little bit more to the story than this and this is where we're going to end up taking a detour into fairy tales and so on because this is a folklore podcast so why not? And there is a story trope around the boy and a cat which was popular in the 13th century within folklore and fairy tales. Other variations exist throughout Europe, although some people think that the original trope actually began in medieval Persia. As an example, Giovanni Francesco Straparola was both a writer and a collector of short stories in the 16th century. He published The Facetious Knight in 1551 in Venice, with the second volume published in 1553. And this was a collection of fairy tales, and it includes some of the first known printed versions in Europe. So no, the Grimms were not the first people to collect fairy tales. But many of the stories feature what is now known as the rise plot, in which a poor person goes from rags to riches, often following some kind of magical intervention. And more importantly for our purposes, the story Costantino Fortunato features a talking cat that manages to earn wealth and marriage for her master. In the tale, the cat is a fairy in disguise that takes gifts to the king in exchange for food that it brings back to Costantino, who lives in poverty. The king thinks that Costantino is the one sending the gifts himself via the cat and then resolves to think of Costantino as being this great wealthy man. The cat then concocts a plan to make Costantino this rich man that the king already thinks that he is. And the cat encourages Costantino to pretend to be drowning in the river near the palace. The king hears about this and has him rescued. And through further trickery, Costantino ends up married to the king's daughter and then he becomes the king himself once his father-in-law dies. So he basically goes from having literally nothing apart from this cat through to having a wife and being king of this particular area. Others have compared Puss in Boots to Costantino Fortunato, but the central rags to riches via the intervention of a cat is similar to that of Dick Whittington. And yes, Dick Whittington's legend is much longer and much more developed, with more of a focus on Dick himself, but the riches would ultimately be impossible without the cat. So what should we ultimately make of the Dick Whittington legend? Well, this brings us on to the other facet of the story, why the legend became more well-known than the truth. And we must remember that Whittington was absolutely not born into poverty, not even by 14th century standards, and he did have the advantages of birth and breeding. But for some reason, the tale, as established by the 17th century, saw him as a poor boy who made his way in the world. This is clearly more attractive for an ordinary audience, as rags to riches stories always hold out the possibility that the listener may also one day escape their station in life and ascend to greatness. Jacqueline Simpson and Steve Rowd suggest that Whittington's generous bequests may have also led to his legend. And it's a valid theory, because in the European boy with the cat tails, the hero often uses his new wealth for good works or becomes benevolent in some way. So in this approach, perhaps people took Whittington's charitable works and rise from Mercer to Lord Mayor and worked backwards. And the cat then became the means by which he achieved his riches. In order to become wealthy, he must have been poor. And thus we end up with the rags to riches tale. And it is also possible that Whittington's benevolent legacy may have inspired people to begin telling tales about him, especially since he left behind no family. Over time, it's possible that these stories just became more and more implausible, as stories often do. 
And if this is the case, by 1612, it's possible that a ballad writer may have seen the legends as ripe fodder for a ballad and then mixed them with the popular boy in a cat tale for better success. Or maybe the earlier stories confuse Whittington's legend with the, po the already popular boy in a cat trope and then they become linked in the popular consciousness by 1612. Ultimately, as with many of the things that we cover on Fabulous Folklore, we'll never know what happened. But I do think it's worthwhile holding those two things in mind at the same time that there was this existing trope for, for the boy and the cat story. And then you've got all these things around the benevolent works which tie into that as well. But while Whittington's story bears little resemblance to the legend, I do actually think that we can at least toast the memory of a man who used his wealth to improve the lives of the poor in his adopted city. And in so doing, he has actually managed to achieve his own sort of immortality, whether or not a cat was actually involved. So what I want to know is what do you think of the Dick Whittington story? Do you think that this is an example of somebody conflating a fairy tale with a legend or is it a story that's developed a life of its own what's going on with it have you seen it as a pantomime indeed did you see the sue pollard and chuckle brothers version please do feel free to let me know as always you can drop a comment in the blog post that this episode is for or you can reply on twitter or instagram or whatever you like it's up to you i am still taking requests for the rest of this month because i think i know which figures i'd like to have a look at but if there are any real people that have legends associated with them that you'd like me to cover, please feel free to use the requests form, which is in the show notes as well, because I'd quite like to cover what people are actually looking for. I'm thinking I might have a look at Lady Godiva next week, but obviously it'll depend how much research I can't actually dig up about her. So that's potentially what we're going to have a look at next week, but we may have to see. Other than that, though, thank you as always for listening. I hope that your 2022 is off to a good start. And I'll see you next week to cover whichever real historical figure it is that we end up looking at who has mysterious and weird legends attached to them. So until then, cheerio. Well, thank you for listening and thanks for visiting Fabulous Folklore. I hope you enjoyed your stay. If you did, why not consider subscribing in your podcast app of choice? If you enjoy the show, why not leave me a review and help other listeners to find it as well? And if you'd like bonus exclusive episodes of the podcast, then why not support me on Patreon? It does help me to keep the show going and it means that you get a little bit extra every month as well. And you can find all of the necessary links in the show notes below. So without any further ado, I will bid you adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next.